All right, these leaves represent your relationship. I took two leaves from the same healthy plant. One of them was given sunlight and water and soil, and the other wasn't, and it died. And that doesn't surprise anyone, does it? We all know what a plant needs to survive. That's obvious, right? The question is, do you know what your relationship needs to survive? What is sunlight and water in that context? Because some things lead to life in your relationship and other things lead to death. Do you know what they are? Because we act surprised when our relationships end. We say things like, we just fell out of love, or I don't know what happened. But the truth is, your plant was being deprived and one or both of you didn't realize it, just like I didn't. But that ignorance comes at a cost. And if you've never asked that question with your partner, then I think there's no better day than today than to simply ask them, in your opinion, can you tell me what you believe a relationship needs to survive? And as they are talking, don't interrupt, don't correct, don't roll your eyes, don't react. Just try to understand. That means listening first and nodding and asking open-ended follow-up questions like, what led you to think or feel that? Or why do you believe that's so important? Or what are some examples you've seen where that worked best? Or how would you like that to show up specifically in your relationship? Because if you ever want to have a partnership with another person, I think it's essential that we actually care about what each other believes is necessary for that to even succeed, right? And yet, if you're like me, I had never asked those questions. And the truth is, we all have an answer to that question. And it affects everything about everything about your relationship together, doesn't it? Let's stop burying our heads in the sand like it doesn't exist, and let's talk about it. All right, so let's answer that question. What does your relationship need? First and foremost, it will always need safety. The entire reason you started this partnership with another person was because you wanted to feel something with them, didn't you? You wanted to experience love. You wanted closeness and connection with them, right? You will never experience any of those long-term without feeling safe, physically or emotionally. We simply cannot be someone who is violent or aggressive or full of rage. There's a zero tolerance policy for any physical harm. And if you've ever engaged in that behavior, I can have compassion and empathy for you because I know you've had a very rough childhood and experienced a lot of pain yourself. However, you are still accountable and need to get help and heal and to the best of your ability, repair the damage you've done to those you've hurt. Because no one ever deserves to be abused, physically or emotionally. And hurt people hurt people. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of any abuse, I just want to say I'm so sorry for what you have been through. My prayer is that you never internalize that and think that you deserved it somehow. You are valuable and worthy of kindness and respect. You aren't broken or flawed. You're wonderful and you deserve love starting with yourself. Physical safety is extremely important, but a relationship still won't survive without emotional safety as well. Closeness and connection will die in environments where there is consistent yelling or name calling or disrespect or disgust. I don't care if that's how your parents fought. I don't care if that's how your other relationships went. It's not healthy, mature, or sustainable, and it will always lead away from love, not towards it. This doesn't mean that you won't get into fights or disrespect each other or lose your temper or get triggered, but we have to be working towards maturity and maturity takes accountability. We stop blaming our parents, we stop blaming our partner or our past, and we take responsibility for what we need to do different. Maturity means learning how to apologize. It's not weakness, it's strength, it's humility, and it's attractive. Maturity means owning our triggers, owning our own destructive defaults that we all have analyzing our conflicts, trying to figure out where we can learn from them and grow. Perfection isn't the goal. Growth is. And growth is learning how to speak to each other in a more respectful and vulnerable tone, understanding and expressing your needs without blame or criticism. Growth is learning how to take breaks when you can feel yourself getting too heated. Growth is pausing, even if it's just for a split second, when you used to become defensive or interrupt or dismiss them, and instead be curious about what they are experiencing or feeling in that moment. Now, people will push back and say, hey, that's not fair. I only yell at them and I only get critical with them because they're neglecting me or they don't listen to me in the first place. Okay, these are two sides of the same coin. Neither is right. Relationships can't survive if one partner feels chronically neglected or when we think we're justified to speak to them however we want because they hurt us first. That's called immaturity. Now, it's true that couples stay together in those environments all the time. I mean, this plant still exists. It's still in the pot. It's just not alive or growing or maturing. And that's the majority of relationships out there. 
dying. That was my relationship in the past. And I'm not a coach or a counselor. I'm not selling you anything. I'm simply here to remind you that your path has a destination. Some paths lead to life. Other paths lead to death. Are you feeding your relationship or depriving it? Because the sad truth is one person alone can't provide it with the water or sunlight that it needs to thrive. It takes both of you. There's simply no room for self-centeredness in these partnerships. Their needs matter just as much as yours do. I mean, if you want this thing to actually be successful. If you want to be blindsided in a few years when they leave, then keep acting like your needs are somehow superior to theirs. There's no room for dominant behavior. There's no room for pride. You are equals. Therefore, you both deserve respect. But if you're not giving it, you're not going to get it. That might work at your job, but it's not going to work in your romantic relationships. No one causes you to yell at each other. No one causes you to become rageful. No one causes you to disrespect them or neglect them. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have grace for you. Those behaviors, those coping mechanisms, were heavily influenced by your past and your childhood. But I can have empathy for your traumas and wounds and for how you learned how to become safe as a child by either becoming anxious or hypervigilant to disconnection or disconnecting from yourself and turning off your feelings and shutting down during conflict and avoiding intimacy altogether. Those things make sense, but healing is still our responsibility, right? It's our choice whether or not we're going to stay ignorant to what any intimate relationship demands from all of us, or we want to keep doing things our own way and keep wondering why it's not working. And listen, I know how hard this is. I'm the guy who never communicated my actual needs or boundaries. And then I would just get resentful and become furious and critical and disrespectful and call them names or dismiss them as a way to punish them because I desperately wanted them to feel the pain that I was feeling deep down. The truth is, if you're being taken for granted, if your boundaries are being neglected, your anger is telling you something. Your resentment is telling you something. There's signals saying, this is not fair. You're feeling abandoned and taken for granted. And that makes sense. It's real. But the answer isn't lashing back out at them to pay them back. The answer is realizing where we need to do a better job at communicating, advocating for our needs, and enforcing our boundaries. Now, I know what you're thinking, but they're not going to listen. They don't care, or they're just going to do whatever they want because they're just a narcissist. Here's my answer. That's a path. Unfortunately, I know that destination, and it's going to lead to the death of this relationship. Because a thriving relationship is one where both partners actually care how the other person feels, right? Two people can't experience closeness if one person doesn't care how the other person feels hurt, alone, or disconnected. That relationship will always die. Why? Because there's no trust. Dr. Sue Johnson, the creator of Emotionally Focused Therapy, says there's one thing that matters in your relationship. One thing separates it all. It's not how you fight. It's not your communication skills. Of course, those play a role. But there's one thing that we have to get right in our relationships or else it can't succeed. And it's emotional responsiveness. Trust is so much more than confidence that your partner isn't going to cheat on you. Trust is confidence that your partner is there for you when you need them, that they care about you. They care about what you need to feel safe, loved, appreciated, and desired. That they think you're important enough to respond to with kindness and compassion. Trust is faith that when I need them, if I reach for them during a vulnerable moment, that they will be there for me. I can count on them. They are my person. Trust doesn't require perfection, just consistency. If we truly want to say that we love someone, we should want them to feel like they can trust our words and actions, right? That they have confidence in us as a partner, that we will move in their direction when they are hurt or in pain, especially if we unintentionally caused it. The way this shows up so often is in our conflicts. We have to work on how we're bringing things up, which we have every right to do, with respect and love. And we have to work on how we receive those things with curiosity and empathy and validation. And I won't go into too much detail on this because I already made a whole video about how to stop fighting in your relationships and I'll link it in the description if you're interested. But it's so important that we remember that we're all more sensitive than we realize. Even the avoidant is far more sensitive than they think. The reason your walls are so high, the reason you've shut off all your feelings, the reason that you've numbed out and you get so defensive and so dismissive is because of how badly someone hurt you in the past. You were neglected emotionally or physically consistently to the point where the only logical and rational conclusion was that people aren't worth trusting because when I trust them, I get hurt. So there's no point. And that makes sense. Sometimes we're so scared to be seen as a failure. It doesn't even feel like it's worth it to try. But we all need to remember that when someone we love reaches for us vulnerably and we reject or invalidate or dismiss them, 
it creates an emotional wound and they will begin to slowly detach from us, which is ironically the last thing that we actually want. But just like what you experienced, it's simply cause and effect. The way out of all this is learning how to be considerate of each other again. Consideration is always at the heart of a mutually fulfilling relationship. Relationships can't survive without consideration. Just think of how amazing a relationship would actually be if two people actually considered each other. A relationship where there's no fear to be open and honest about our inner world, about what we're feeling or thinking or needing. A relationship where you know they value you and they won't take advantage of you or use your vulnerabilities against you. Isn't that what we all want? If you're in a relationship, be that person. And if you're dating someone and the person you're dating doesn't seem like they consider you, break up with them. Yes, it's hard, but you deserve better. And there's literally no point in wasting time with someone who has no ability or desire to consider you. Now, I know what all the married people are thinking. Well, what about me? My partner doesn't consider me at all. What should I do? And honestly, I can't answer that for you. That's something that you need to be talking with a professional about because you deserve someone who can hear your entire story and guide you on what's the best course of action for you. But I can tell you this. When you have a relationship where one partner doesn't feel consistently considered, closeness and connection aren't possible. So if you both actually want to stay together, then learn how to be honest with each other. Learn how to open up. Learn how to be vulnerable and talk about what consideration means to you and then do the hard work of being intentionally considerate. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Sometimes we feel like we're being considerate, but our partner doesn't agree. In those instances, we need to remember, this isn't about proving who is right or wrong. This is about understanding the dynamic that we're in. Our plant isn't getting enough water or sunlight. That's just a fact. Does it mean the plant is wrong? No. Some plants only need a little bit of water. Others live in water. The point is we just need to understand what's happening. So first, get in the right headspace to actually listen to your partner. Ask questions, validate any feelings or vulnerabilities as real and valid. And when it's your turn to talk, if you're feeling a strong urge to defend yourself, be honest about that. Learn about where that is coming from and admit this is really hard to hear. That would sound something like this. I care about what you're feeling. And if I'm honest, I have a really strong urge to defend myself right now. I'm frustrated that you don't see my efforts as enough. It makes me feel like I'm not enough. And it makes me scared that I'll be taken advantage of or that your standards are too high that I'll never actually meet them. And that makes me scared of being seen as a failure, which doesn't make me want to put in more effort, but instead pull away and protect myself from that shame. And if the other person was being considerate, they might say, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing. I don't want you to feel shame and I can understand how hard that would be thinking that you're doing everything you can do and it's still not enough. I don't consider you a bad partner. I just think we might be showing love to each other in different ways. And if you're open to it, let's talk about how we can redirect some of the efforts you're already putting in to the areas where I feel connected and valued most. Sound good? Do you see how that's so much better than you're such a selfish narcissist who doesn't even love me and the other person saying, nothing I do will ever be good enough for you. We can learn how to communicate with each other, but it takes self-reflection, which is learned. It takes emotional maturity, which is learned. It takes vulnerability and empathy and consideration, which all can be learned. You both just have to have the desire to learn it. And when we consider each other and when we trust each other, we are far more flexible and less controlling. If one partner loves their alone time and independence, that's fine. Give them that time. But if that's you and your partner is giving you that freedom and not being controlling or passive aggressive about it, it's your job to reciprocate that consideration and be cognizant of their vulnerabilities or fears around disconnection and tell them how long you're going to be gone, when you'll be back and remind and reassure them that you can't wait to see them. Plan a date night for when you get back so they have something to look forward to. It's all these little things that end up making the biggest difference between thriving or dying. When we consider each other equally, there's no power dynamic. We influence each other. We care about each other. We look for ways to appreciate each other. We navigate conflict as a team instead of us versus them. We take on conflict head on. We talk about it before we're in one so we know the game plan and we hold each other accountable in a loving and respectful way. This is what marriage expert Dr. John Gottman calls accepting each other's influence. Can you imagine how fulfilling a relationship would be if both partners actually accepted each other's influence? That means we're malleable, we're flexible, we're responsive to constructive feedback. We're open. Do you know why we're open? because we're supposed to trust each other. We feel connected to them. We feel bonded. 
When you have this mindset, I don't care what the conflict is about, the domestic labor, the parenting, moving to a new city, taking a new job, the dishes, the bedroom, it's all the same game plan. We are considerate about how these things affect our partner and their mindsets around them. And we are mutually interested in learning about what our partner needs to feel valued and desired and loved in these areas. Is that your relationship? Because it needs to be. It's like a great friendship. When we feel safe, when we feel trusting, we can relax and play and have fun together. Do you have any idea how important having fun together is? It's vital. Fun is bonding. And that's most likely how you fell in love together in the first place, doing something fun, right? And I understand full well everything that gets in the way of your playfulness together. But it's your job to fight against that current. Stress is usually a huge component, isn't it? That's why as each other's partner, it's our job to learn about each other's stressors, carry each other's burdens, find out where the blocks are and what we can help to do to remove them, and prioritize fun again. In true friendships, we naturally defer to each other. We more easily give the benefit of the doubt or move in their direction because we aren't trying to protect ourselves from being taken for granted, right? One person isn't always bending in the other person's direction. It's equal. That's what makes true friendship so great. You're naturally kind to each other. You're not afraid that your efforts aren't going to be reciprocated. Another thing that our relationship needs is transparency. Secrets don't build trust. They break it. Not being able to talk to your partner about things that are on your heart doesn't build trust. It breaks it. My advice? Be courageous enough to learn how to practice having the hard conversations. It's really the only way forward anyways. Learn about how they feel loved and valued most. And also learn about what pushes them away or makes them feel disconnected in this relationship. Learn about their triggers and insecurities. Invest in this relationship again. Be intentional. Prioritize each other. Go out of your way to compliment each other regularly. Practice intimate conversations together. The average couple rarely talks anymore, and they are unhappy and unfulfilled. You don't think those two things are related at all? Be as physically affectionate with each other as you can. And men never forget, for so many women, she needs to feel safe and valued and emotionally connected outside of the bedroom before she has a desire for you inside of the bedroom. Affection doesn't start in the bedroom. She needs to know that you value her body all the other times of the day. So kiss her, hug her, touch her gently with no push for the bedroom. I'm willing to bet that is a turn on for her. And I understand some of this seems very far fetched because of the partners that you've been with or the partner that you're currently with. And I am in no way discounting how difficult it might be for you to have a healthy relationship one day. This stuff always takes two willing participants and some of you only have one. Now, does that mean that you'll never experience intimacy or connection with the person you're currently with? Maybe, but also maybe not. Because when we change for the better, when we decide I'm not going to fight anymore, I'll talk about how I'm angry and what I need to feel close or what I need to repair this. I'll learn how to self-regulate and set healthy boundaries and be vulnerable, but I'm not going to yell or scream anymore to be heard. When we make positive changes in ourselves, that's growth and it positively impacts the relationship. I didn't say it saves it, but it impacts it in a positive way. The relationship might still end, but if it ends because of you making healthy changes, it was already a sinking ship. You becoming the best version of yourself only sped up the inevitable because they weren't interested in putting in the work. And some of you need to do what Emily and I had to do and recognize that your plant is on the verge of dying. And sometimes that means leaving the situation, but other times it means staying and flat out telling them, I can't be in this relationship anymore. However, I am willing to go to counseling and put in the hard work of learning how to love you so that we can both feel close and connected to each other. I'm willing to do that work and start a brand new relationship with you built on a foundation of trust and respect and intimacy. Tell them, I don't think you're the enemy and I won't let the counselor blame you as the main problem either, if that's what you're afraid of. I think you're doing everything that you know to do, but this isn't working for me. So if you want this relationship to continue, I need you to come and learn about what efforts we both need to put in and change in order for this to become a mutually fulfilling relationship. Now, does that mean that they will go? No, because love is always a risk and connection always takes two. But this is our best chance at the type of relationship that you deserve. But if both people are willing, once you change your mindset and set appropriate goals, we can plant seeds of safety and trust and emotional responsiveness. And with water and sunlight, those seeds can grow into something beautiful. The truth is, I don't know you, but I want the best for both of you. And I know healing is possible. I felt it and I've experienced it. Every time you go to a wedding, you look at these two people and you think, maybe they can make it. 
Maybe they can experience actual reciprocal love. And you're right, they can. And so can you. But it takes work. And there's a lot of people out there that are depriving your plant of what it needs to survive. You're depriving your relationship and you don't even realize it. You're hiding behind your shame. You're too scared to open up again. So many of us are just protecting ourselves from pain. But what we have to realize is that sometimes those protections are now hurting your relationship. So have the humility and the courage to come to your partner and say, I'm so sorry. I think I've been hurting us. Let's start this over but not by building a bridge over the hurt you've experienced and pretending like it doesn't exist. Instead, I want to wade through it with you. I'm willing to do the work. I wanna learn how to repair and reconnect. I wanna invite and encourage us to be honest, even at the risk of my own discomfort. I wanna to work towards safety and respect, and I know I'm gonna mess up and it's gonna be hard, but you're worth it. We're worth it. Help me learn how to love again. Help me to go deep with you like we did in the beginning. This is what leads to a thriving relationship that we all want and deserve. Not a perfect relationship, but a loving and respectful one. Thank you so much for watching. Know that I'm praying for you and pulling for you.